Today my group is going to evaluate, uh, explain the active evaluation models and critically evaluate the successfulness. Um, Leah I would describe the value relevance literature and uh, Logo would describe the analysis models after that. Susan and Ernest would uh, introduce the academic models. Uh, finally, Pierre would take charge of the evaluation and uh, conclusion parts. The value relevance which related to the evaluation of model success is defined as the ability of financial statements information which capture and summarize the information that affects the share prices and empirically uh, is measured as a statistic statistical association between market value and accounting numbers in our presentation. We will measure this using the analysis model and the academics model. Next turn to Logan. When valuing the stock, analysis usually use comparative modules using ratio. Ratio analysis is the qualitative analysis of financial information from a company's financial statements or share price. One of the most common ratio analysis is PE ratio. PE ratio is the ratio for valuing a company that measures its current share price relative to its per share earnings. It's calculated by taking the current price of a stock dividing by the company's earning per share. Now I will evaluate the P ratio. P ratio has the advantages of measuring the market confidence in the future earning power of the business, which compare which compare financial figures with the similar company, and also it will be faster and easier to make decisions on purchasing and selling stock. However, it has some limitations. One primary limitation of using PE ratios emergence when comparing PE ratios of different companies. Valuations and growth rates of companies may often vary widely between, between sectors due both to the differing ways companies earn money and to the differing timelines during which companies earn that money. According to Ives Picardo 2014, because a company's debt can affect both the prices of shares and the company's earnings, leverages can screw P ratios as well. Now I hand over to Yanis. Thanks, Logan. Now I will introduce one of the academic model, dividend dividend discount model. It specifies the benefits from investing stocks to be dividends. The stock is undervalued if the value obtained from the DDM is higher than the current market share price. The DDM assumes that investors' aim of purchasing stocks is to receive dividends and it uses future dividends to predict the share price of stocks. The formula shows the share price uh, at time zero is equal to dividend received each year discounted by investor required rate of return, with the assumption that the rate of return is never changed. Thus, to simple every year's prediction, assume a constant growth rate of dividends, so that is golden growth model. DDM is simple to calculate and it is more understandable than other models. It is easier to be used to compare different sizes of companies and different industries, as it doesn't consider of market condition. However, there are several limitations. Firstly, it cannot be used when the stock doesn't pay dividends, uh, as the premise of DDM is that the dividends is the only way to reflect the value of a stock. Furthermore, dividends yields fluctuate substantially over time. So the value of stock worked out from the DDM would exceed the duration. The slight error in calculation could deter whether it is under, undervalued or overvalued, then influence in investors' decision. Thirdly, it focuses on the limited information and the data, so it might not outcrop the fundamental determinants of firm value. Another academic model we, we will explain is residual income model. RIVM relates to simultaneous uh, future earnings, book values, and the dividends. The residual income is net income less than opportunity cost of generating net income, where um, this model deducts the estimated cost of equity capital and are used to measure the value of ind individual shares and indices. There are three main assumptions in Olson's 1995 uh, paper. First, the present value of expected dividends determines the market value and the discount factor equal to the risk free rate. Secondly, the accounting numbers and dividends satisfy the clean surplus relation, which implies no injections or uh, withdrawals of capital. 
and dividends reduce book value without affecting current earnings. Certainly, this a linear model frames uh, frames the uh, stochastic time series behavior of research earnings. So Olson gave a formula of RIVM, and it could be derived de derived by EBO models and applies to golden models. Uh, the formula will turn to like this. Now I will hand over to Susan to evaluate RIVM. Now I will evaluate the effectiveness of the RIVM. Uh, firstly, the clean steel price duration can implement the value analysis. According to Olsen 1995, all value relevant events will be absorbed by current or subsequent periods earnings and book values. Generally, it shows the relevance of abnormal earnings as variable and uh, that influences a firm's value. Uh, this will provide a more accurate, uh, ac accurate equity valuation. The, the difference between the market value and the book value comes to focus. And it can also be used in the capital budgeting, according to Olson and the Pisnail. Um, the cleaning surplus relation can be used to shift the value analysis away from the DDM to book value plus the present value of the expected abnormal earnings. It is useful in practical business to the extent that cash flow capital budgeting measures will be incapable of being reconciled with familiar accounting measures. Then there is a danger that they will not receive enough attention. In such case, excess income figures can be computed and used as substitute for cash flows. Um, another advantage of a uh, residual income valuation model is that it, it can solve the concern from dividend irrelevance. Dividend policy irrelevancy makes it awkward to evaluate present value expected dividend model directly. In contrast, residual income valuation model with its focus on expected residual earnings does not depend on the dividend policy, which is applied by MM model. According to MM 1961, Dividends are paid out of book value and, and not out of the current earnings. And this will uh, result in a paradox, which is that the PV of the expected dividends determines firm's value, yet the prediction of the dividend sequence is basically irrelevant. So if the dividend payout pattern does not change, um, why, the, why people will want, will want to expect uh, predict the future dividend and predict the market mar market price of the market value of the firm. And uh, the uh, residual income valuation model provides a solution which is to elaborate on how dividend influence current and future accounting data realization. Um, there are also several limitations of the uh, res residual income valuation model. The concept that value equals present value of expected dividends derives fundamentally from a per share perspective. To equal the residual income value and the present value of expected dividend. Therefore, it requires that clean surplus holds on a per share per basis, but this clean surplus restriction on a per share basis cannot be met when the number of shares outstanding change. For example, there might be a large number of convertible loans converted into the shares. Um, secondly, the violations of clean surplus are also magnified by the JAP because JAP does not rely on a um, proprietorship concept in prescribing the accounting rules for certain capital transactions, for example, the accounting for options attached on the shares. A total value perspective on residual income valuation uh, should be based on firstly, the issuing and the buying shares are value irrelevant transactions. Uh, so they are irrelevant in the sense of MM model. And secondly, GAP measures capital contribution correctly, which means they should uh, measure the capital contribution per market value. And the first point can be is estimated in the real world. However, uh, the GAP violates clean surplus because some capital contributions are not accounted for, accounted for in market value terms. Um, then I will turn to Lin to talk about talk about the other limitations of residual income valuation model. Uh, I'd like to talk about two more limitations. Firstly, if the firm intends to bring new shareholders, that would influence the work of the whole capital approach. Next, the theory have, haven't told the investors how to get 
access to the data. Besides, the model used the, the past figures to forecast the future besides business performance. Uh, now I pass to Pierre. <coughs> I will do the evaluation and conclusion part for our report. Uh, so first of all, which model to use when we value equities? Most of the companies would find out that there are an overwhelming number of valuation techniques available from them today. There are the simple ones to use, such as the comparable methods, and there are also the more involved methods, such as the discounted cash flow model. So which one should you use? Unfortunately, there is no one method that is best suited for every situation. Each stock is different, and each industry sector has unique properties that may require varying valuation approaches. So generally, this type of valuation is a lot easier and quicker to do than the absolute valuation methods, which is why many investors and analysts started their analysis with this method. According to Logan, the P-E ratio is the most commonly used one because it focuses on the earnings of the company, which is one of the primary drivers of for investors. And secondly, what to focus when we value equities? In our team's perspective, it makes more economic sense to focus on expected earning per share and adjusted for diluted earnings per share as a valuation attribute, instead of using current book value and expected residual earnings, as they would be more relevant and make the models be more useful. Thirdly, is the models able to provide a framework to do our future forecast? Forecasting in long-term growth rate is of particular importance. Residual earnings valuation model is appropriate for forecasting free cash flows and dividends if other suitable valuation approaches are adopted, according to Nassim and Penman in 2001. And in conclusion, we believe that there is no one method that is the best suited for every situation for the market for each of the company. So therefore, we have to have the ability to adapt to different scenarios and choose different models to tackle different situations. According to Panem, a professor in Columbia University, valuation is a matter of accounting and the practicality of a valuation model depends on the accounting involved. Valuation must be consistent with the theory of finance, but it's only completely satisfied by specifying the appropriate accounting. This is the end of our presentation, and here's our reference list. Thank you for listening.